Reading by heart the words cut into black granite that she had written for him when they both thought he would die first. I believe in the miracles of art, but what prodigy will keep you safe beside me? Or he is back by now in his half-empty house, talking in ink to a piece of paper. I, who so often used to wish to float free of earth, now with all my being want to stay, to climb with you on other evenings to the stone, maybe finding a bear or a coyote, like the one who at dusk a week ago passed in his scissorish gait ten feet from where we sat. This earth we attach ourselves to so fiercely, like scions of Sheffield seek no furthers, grafted for our lifetimes onto paradise, paradise rootstock. When I was uh, 17 and a freshman at the University of Arizona, Galway came to our school and read from the manuscript of the book that would soon be published, The Book of Nightmares. I um, did not know that a poem, or maybe I didn't know that anything, could mirror back so much of the inner life, give one so much of oneself back, and also demonstrate that there was so much more in here to know, so much more to feel, so much further to go. I also didn't know that poetry could also make the language itself larger, increase its capacity, its potential for naming experience, for making something commensurate with what it's like to live. I especially didn't know that for um, 44 more years, I would be reading those poems and finding in them more and more of my own life, finding in them more and more of the possibilities of language. Those poems that we love the best, I think, become touchstones. They become ways of charting your own experience. And how many touchstones have been given to me by Galway? This is a poem called Wait. Wait for now. Distrust everything if you have to. But trust the hours. Haven't they carried you everywhere up to now? Personal events will become interesting again. Hair will become interesting. Pain will become interesting. Buds that open out of season will become interesting. Secondhand gloves will become lovely again. Their memories are what give them the need for other hands. The desolation of lovers is the same. That enormous emptiness carved out of such tiny beings as we are asked to be filled. The need for the new love is faithfulness to the old. Wait. Don't go too early. You're tired. But everyone's tired. But no one is tired enough. Only wait a little and listen. Music of hair. Music of pain. Music of looms weaving our loves again. Be there to hear it. It will be the only time. Most of all, to hear your whole existence, rehearsed by the sorrows, play itself into total exhaustion. <coughs> this is, I believe, Galway's shortest poem. Um, it, it, he it has proudly pointed out, is also the only known sentence it, it, I think he's right about this, in English, in which the verb is appears three times in a row, and it is nonetheless grammatically correct. Um, and this is a poem that uh, I often you know, cite this poem in workshops or in classes I'm teaching, and I always read it twice because it goes by so quickly. Okay, so you're going to get it twice, too, just so you know. You have time. There's another train coming after the first one. <laughs> Prayer. Whatever happens... Whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. 
prayer. Whatever happens, whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. And lastly, a poem from um, a poem from the past called That Silent Evening. I will go back to that silent evening when we lay together and talked in silent voices. While outside, slow lumps of soft snow fell, hushing as they got near the ground, with a fire in the room in which centuries of tree went up in a continuous ghost giving up, without a crackle, into morning light. Not until what hastens went slower did we sleep. When we got home, we turned and looked back at our tracks twining out of the woods, where the branches we brushed against let fall puffs of sparkling snow, quickly, in silence, like stolen kisses, and where the scritch, scritch, scritch among the trees, which is the sound that dies inside the sparks from the wedge when the sledge hits it off center, telling everything inside it is fire, jumped to a black branch, puffed up, but without arms, and so to our eyes lonesome, and yet also, how can we know this happy in shape of chickadee? Lying still in snow, not iron-willed like railroad tracks, willing not to meet until heaven, but here and there treading sloppy, kissing stops. Our tracks wobble across the snow, their long scratch. So many things that happen here are really little more, if even that, than a scratch too. Words in our mouths are almost ready, already, to bandage the one whom the scritch, 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 meaning if, how, when, we might lose each other, scratches, 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 from this moment to that. Then I will go back to that silent evening, when the past just managed to overlap the future, if only by a trace, and the light doubles and casts through the dark a sparkling that heavens the earth. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to read uh, part seven of Under the Mod Moon. And there's a wonderful word in this poem, bee stings. Um, yeah, sure. There's, is that better? A little bit. <laughs> Um, there's a wonderful word in this poem, bee stings, which is uh, a better word for colostrum than colostrum. It's the first milk of a lactating animal, um, usually a cow, in this case, the cosmos. When it was cold on our hillside and you cried in the crib rocking through the darkness, I would knifed down to the curve of a smile, a sadness stranger than ours, all of it flowing from the other world. I used to come to you and sit by you and sing to you. You did not know, and yet you will remember in the silent zones of the brain, a specter, descendant of the ghostly forefathers, singing to you in the nighttime not the songs of light said to wave through the bright hair of angels, but a blacker rasping flowering on that tongue. For when the mod moon glimmered in those first nights, and the archer lay sucking the icy beastings of the cosmos in his crib of stars, I had crept down to the river bank, their long rustle of being and perishing, down to the marshes, where the earth oozes up in cold streaks, touching the world with the underglimmer of the beginning, and there learned my only song. And in the days when you find yourself orphaned, emptied of all wind singing of light, the pieces of cursed bread on your tongue, may there come back to you a voice, spectral, calling you, sister, from everything that dies 
and then you shall open this book, even if it is the book of nightmares. This book, this very book, um, goes back about 35 years to a class that um, C.K. Williams taught at my college in contemporary American poetry. And then, um, I think like Mark, I uh, came to some new understanding. Um, I think at that point, Galway Canal, um, along with Denise Levertov, embodied, began to embody for me the, the lyric poem. Um, lyric because of the singing and because of how in that singing, the poet steps out of linear time and holds open the moment for us. And um, that's still true. I'm going to read a poem that appeared in The New Yorker um, just two years ago called Astonishment. Orlocks knock in the dusk, a rowboat rises and settles, surges and slides. Under a great eucalyptus, a boy and a girl feel around with their feet for those small, flattish stones so perfect for scudding across the water. A dog barks from deep in the silence. A woodpecker, double knocking, keeps time. I have slept in so many arms. Consolation, probably, but too much consolation may leave one inconsolable. The water before us is hardly moved except in the shallowest breathing places. For us back then, to live seemed almost to die. One day a darkness fell between her and me. When we woke, a hawthorn sprig stood in the water glass at our bedside. There is a silence in the beginning. The life within us grows quiet. There is little fear. No matter how all this comes out, from now on, it cannot not exist ever again. We like talking our nights away in words close to the natural language, which most other animals can still speak. The present pushes back the life of regret. It draws forward the life of desire. Soon, memory will have started sticking itself all over us. We were fashioned from clay in a hurry. Poor throwing may, have, may mean it didn't matter to the makers if their pots cracked. On the mountain tonight, the full moon faces the full sun. Now could be the moment when we fall apart or we become whole. Our time seems to be up. I think I can even hear it stopping. Why then have we kept up the singing for so long? Because that's the sort of determined creature we are. Before us, our first task is to astonish, and then harder by far to be astonished. So glad to be with you. I'm going to read three poems. The first one is Blackberry Eating, which Tom spoke about so well. It's got a very odd word in it. B-R-O-U-G-H-A-M-E-D. Uh, I called a friend of mine in England and I asked him how he pronounced it and he said, well mate, that would be Broham, um, which is a, a light horse-drawn carriage. And I said, well, actually, we pronounce it with one syllable, broom. And he said, well, that would be slang now, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so I suddenly had a vision of this word, Americanized version of slang. 
and um, a line of American poetry opened up for me from uh, Walt Whitman to William Carlos Williams to Galway Canal. He's an American romantic in that tradition. Blackberry eating. I love to go out in late September among the fat, overripe, icy blackberries to eat blackberries for breakfast. The stalk's very prickly, a penalty they earn for knowing the black art of blackberry making. And as I stand among them, lifting the stalks to my mouth, the ripest berries fall almost unbidden to my tongue, as words sometimes do, certain peculiar words, like strengths, or squinched, or broom, many lettered, one syllable lumps, while I squeeze, squinch open, and splurge well in the silent, startled, icy black language of blackberry eating in late September. I've chosen three poems for you, and uh, I've got a point. Um, and I've chosen these poems to prove my point. <laughs> and the point is that uh, most of the poetry of the 20th century is a poetry of despair and negation and dread. And that poetry begins with one of the great poems of English poetry, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And I believe that Galway Canal's work acknowledges the nightmare, but takes a radical turn against that. And that one of the great poets of despair also turned himself into a great poet of celebration. And that that element of celebration and praise is extremely rare in poetry. And that we are very lucky to have had a poet who wrote in the line of Whitman and Crane and Lawrence a poetry of praise. The Isle of Wood Fire. When Fergus woke crying at night, I would carry him from his crib to the rocking chair and sit holding him before the fire of thousand-year-old olive wood. Sometimes for reasons I never knew and he has forgotten, even after his bottle, the big tears would keep on rolling down his big cheeks, the left cheek always more brilliant than the right, and we would sit, some nights for hours, rocking in the light eking itself out of the ancient wood, and hold each other against the darkness, his close behind and far away in the future, mine I imagined all around. One such time, fallen half asleep myself, I thought I heard a scream, a flyer crying out in horror, as he dropped fire on, he didn't know what or whom, or else a child thus set aflame and sat up alert. The olive wood fire had burned low. In my arms lay Fergus, fast asleep, left cheek glowing, God. And finally, this extraordinary poem from Mortal Acts, Mortal Words, St. Francis and the Sow. And the transformation of this poem is the transformation I'm talking about. How to turn something seemingly ugly into something remarkably beautiful. And that's been the work of really one of our greatest American poets, Galway Canal. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow, and the sow began remembering all down her thick length, from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail, from the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart 
to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 teats into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long, perfect loveliness of sound. <laughs> Whatever happens, whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. I must think, um, that poem must run through my mind three or four times a week. It has become such an essential part of me. I wasn't going to read it because Mark did, but I have to tell you a funny story. There's a young poet who loved that poem so much he had it tattooed on his back. <laughs> and I was with, remember this Bobby? We were in Provincetown when the young man showed Galway his back. And Galway looked at that poem and then said, uh, you forgot one of the isn't. <laughs> There were only two isms. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, a little arrow is, you know. It's a joy to be with you. It's a joy to be with you, Galway. Um, you have not only been a great guiding star for me all my life in poetry, but you've been a poet in the world. You've been an example of how to be a poet in the world. And your generosity of spirit, your political uh, tenacity, um, your generosity uh, to other young poets.